You know, I, I think um, even before I was in the ministry, maybe in 1977 or so, I... Um, uh, knew the verse, I know it's Daniel 9, but it says that his temple will be built in troubled times, and it will be, I believe, natural. I believe there'll be a temple in Israel, uh, the natural, but I believe the temple of God. I taught last week, uh, this will be part two, although it'll be a totally different take on it, but last week, for many people are out of town this week and last week as well, but I'll give you a brief summary of last week. I taught on uh, Jesus said, I will build my church. And I told you, he took, uh, he said this about building his church in two different places. He had been in uh, Bethesda and he walks with these guys up north into a bad area called Caesarea Philippi. It's a review for some of you, but I think it's important to hear this again. He takes him to Caesarea Philippi where it was known to be a demonic shrine. There was a shrine of Pan, a Greek god. There was one for uh, Caesar. And then there was a rock called the Rock of the Gods that was right there. And then there was a cave right near there, all in that same area, by which it was known to be a demonic, evil place. It was known to the local people. And a good Israelite young man or woman would never go there because it was considered the worst place in Israel to go. It was considered wicked. And uh, it was also called the Gate of Hell. And they believed that Baal came in and out from the lower regions into the earth through that area. So Jesus goes there, he walks with these guys, takes them there, and then he asks this question, say, who am I? You know, and they said, well, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets and stuff. He says, well, who do you guys say I am? And Peter, listen now, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he hears from heaven and he says, you are Christ, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're Peter, you're a little rock, Listen now, you're a little rock because every time you hear from heaven, you become more and more like me because I'm the big rock and on growing on the revelation of who I am, on this Petra, which is the rock of revelation of who I am, I'm going to build my ecclesia. That's what he said there, the word church is ecclesia. And the word ecclesia basically means, uh, through Roman culture in those days, it meant the governing authorities who would go out and Romanize a, uh, a uh, conquered land. So, all of that to say, then he gives them the keys of the kingdom and so forth. But the point is, is, is that he said, I'll build my church. When you hear of me, then you become like me. We are both rocks. You're a little pebble. You'll be my uh, body. You'll be my temple. You'll be my ecclesia. I'll govern through you. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And that's what I taught last week, and I went into the more detail. But today I'm going to go in a little different perspective, and uh, I hope um, it's encouraging to you. I wanted to first of all mention one of the verses that I've been getting for this season, both in the church and in our nation, is, let's go to 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, And Paul, of course, is talking to the Corinthians, and, you know, they, um, they were people who loved God, but uh, there were times when, especially the second epistle, he really had to deal with those guys. So you better test yourself and see whether you're in the faith. But he knew that there was a faithful group of people there. I'll just quote it to you. Are you going to be able to get it up? Okay, fine. I'll just quote it to you. It says that, he said, there, it, it happens, so happens that there must be divisions among you so that those who are approved of God may be made manifest. That's what the verse says, Okay. And um, with things that are going on today, it's important that we end up on the right side when there's division. Jesus said in Matthew 10, starting at verse 34, he says, you know, I have not come to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword. And then he talks about divisions within even family, close family members and stuff. It's like, wow, Lord, really? And then he talks about picking up your cross and then he says, you must love me more than the family, your family. And it's like, okay, wow. Well, of course, he's going to give us, as we find him as our new life, he's going to give us his love to love people. He's not taking away something and then not giving us back anything. He's saying, you're living as natural people in a fallen race. It's not going to work. You must put me first, then I become your life. That's the mystery of the cross, Christ within the hope of glory. And then you'll be able to love your family and friends. But there will be divisions. Early on, his family said he must have lost his mind. But later on, they followed him. James and Jude both have epistles in the scripture. And his mother and his brothers were in the upper room on Pentecost. 
But there was a painful time when they thought he had lost his mind. Do you know that? And uh, so he, you know, they were, he was cleansing the temple and stuff. They said, oh my gosh, you know, he must have lost it. The people were saying he must have a demon, and even his own family thought so. So don't feel bad if you have little division in your, in your family uh, and so forth. And if they think you're crazy, uh, you're on the right track, okay? That's what I, that's what I want you to know. And, uh, but I want you to end up on the right side of town. So um, is it going to work at all? Or should I just quote the scriptures? Okay, fine. Well, whatever. Who knows what happened? L- let me just uh, read for you. What? Uh, that was 1 Corinthians 11.19. I quoted it. I'm going to go now to the third chapter of... Um, Malachi, and this, this means a lot to me because it's another one of division. The people have been arguing with God. They've been saying, man, it's hard to serve him, you know. People who don't serve him, they're getting blessed. That's all in chapter three, you know. But he says, I'm going to come to you like a refiner's fire. And then he begins to deal with them. He says, you guys need to return. They said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, with your tithes and offerings, if you, your heart is, your treasure is where your heart is, you begin to come to me and pour out your heart, give, be faithful in your giving. He goes, I'll open up the windows of heaven. And the people are still complaining. And then he says in chapter 3, verse 16, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard, and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions or my jewels. So he's making a distinction when he comes. He comes as a refiner's fire. People are complaining. They're not giving and so forth. They're just lukewarm believers, whatever. There's all kinds of issues going on. He comes and says, but those who feared the Lord begin to connect with each other. That's who I believe I'm talking to, to be honest. You know, it's who I believe I'm called to talk to. So, um, uh, anyway, oh boy, that's a big subject. Uh, they will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. I will spare them just as a man has compassion and spares his own son who serves him. And then you will again see the distinction, that is a division, between the righteous and the wicked, those who serve God and those who do not. Um, I, I want to make it clear that I believe that there's division at times, and sometimes it's necessary to bring forth and to allow God to show who's approved. Like, what is right, you know? Who knows? And of course, it's those who are in union with the Lord, and I want to tell you how uh, to do this. Um, I just want to say that I found out um, when we first started really pastoring and teaching in our home that this time of year was a difficult year for many people because of family, loss of family, uh, because of family still alive and makes it painful and difficult and so forth. And um, so in, in that, I was reflecting yesterday. I think of, you know, uh, loved ones who are gone. Uh, I think of, you know, things that are happening in our church with people and so forth. And just waiting on the Lord, what I call it being reflective, like just allowing God to sort of, you know, stir up anything he wants to in my heart. And many times when I go to him, you know, I mean, I've done all my studies and stuff. I'm prepared to preach at any time, anywhere on multiple things. If people ask me, it's no problem. But when I go before him like that, it's like, I I don't have a message. I have no clue what you want to say. And so that's where I start out always. It's like I've never preached before. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. So I begin to just sit there, and it begins to sort of bubble up a little bit, you know. And um, he basically began to talk to me about, which I mentioned last week, the first beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who know their need for God, for theirs is the rule, dominion of heaven. They enter into that. So that first beatitude is the door to enter in. I was taught this years ago, uh, maybe 20, I don't know, 18 years ago or whatever, that he said the first beatitude sets you up to be like Jesus, and we'll go to that in just a moment. But one of the things that's been, I think, difficult is, is that with, you know, memories, sometimes sad, sometimes glad, t- sometimes bad, our hearts can go in the wrong direction at Christmas circumstances and so forth. But if we obey and become part of the nature of Jesus, as the first beatitude encourages us, we enter in, listen, we enter in to the dominion of heaven. So therefore and I'll explain this more, 
But therefore, if I am sad, and for logical reasons, good logical reasons, you know, I have relatives that aren't here anymore, and I miss them, and so forth and so on, and um, others that are struggling and involved in things that make life sad and discouraging. But if I allow my heart to go there, then I'm going to be, are you ready? I'm going to stay conformed to the world in that realm, okay? I can be sad. I mean, it's good to mourn and so forth, but, you know, those who mourn shall be comforted. So I need to have my mourning turn into comfort, right? Right? So with sad things that happen in this life, what, what are we supposed to do? Well, I'll explain to you that we must have our hearts eventually end up at the door into the kingdom of God by going in and absolutely having our hearts connect with what Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the rule of the kingdom of God. They enter in. So here I was yesterday, you know, taking in all these emotional issues and stuff, not only for myself, but for others, and thinking of painful things in my childhood, and all of this, and good things, and so forth. And I'm sitting there, it's like, okay, Lord, you know, uh, help me, you know, get out of this, you know, what are you doing? He says, look, look, at, I'm going to show you how to enter into heaven. I'm teaching you how to enter into heaven, even on earth, because I said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have the kingdom of God within us, right? Isn't that all true? So anyway, Jesus taught us how to escape, okay? We must recognize that when we come into this world and we deal with painful situations, our heart can go in the wrong direction. We must come to a place, and it's not like uh, by manpower or willpower. It has to be heaven power or it's a religion. It has to be heaven power. And I'll explain this. This is all the first beatitude I'm talking about. I need to have the dominion and rule of heaven. And Jesus uses the word blessing or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So I'm going to enter into a blessing. In this case, the rule of heaven into my life and into my heart. And I have to deal with the fact that, number one, I have to have my mind renewed. Whatever is you know, good and, and holy and noble and things, think on those things. So I think, okay, God, you're good in the midst of all this. But I live in a fallen world. That's the way I look at things. You're a little bit of heaven, a little bit of hell. I live right in the middle. People are going to heaven, they're going to hell. That's sad, isn't it? There's a devil who's destroying people's lives. There's a God who wants to save them. That's my thing. That's why, you know, life is serious to me on some cases and uh, more so all the time. So let's look at, um, can, we, can we do it at all or is it dead? Okay, we're getting there. Well, anyway, uh, it just says, uh, we'll just look at Matthew 5.3 in your Bibles if you carry them. Anyway, it just says, Blessed are those who know they need God. That's the best translation. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the dominion, the kingdom, the rule, the power and authority of heaven. So it's like, okay, fine. So what I need then is I need to be poor in spirit. I wonder how I'm going to do that. Okay, I say to you, okay, here's my word for you. Everybody, ready? One, two, three. Be poor in spirit. Okay? Well, of course, uh, that would be another works. But there must be an answer for me to be poor in spirit. The answer is, is Jesus. Matthew 11, 28, 29, someone read it today. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. He said, you know, learn of me. Translations say learn of me or learn from me. I, I don't know which is the more correct but I know that when Jesus is teaching me about himself, I'm learning of him. So I'll just read my NIV. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That was the word I got today, rest, that he said, you know, let me be your pillow. It's like, okay, that's great. You know, it's, it sounds good, Jesus, but that's just an advertisement until I get to enter in. Many people try to make it happen. It's still an advertisement, but you want it to be real. You don't want to eat the menu or look at the menu. You want to eat what the menu tells you you can order. So therefore, what we're talking about is a Christianity that's experiential. Jesus said, this is eternal life, 
that they might experientially know you, Father, in Jesus Christ whom you sent. So I'm going to now teach you how to have this experience that I had yesterday. And that's why I'm preaching on this. He said, uh, uh, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then he says, For I am gentle and humble in heart. That's the main part I want. So I need to be gentle and humble in heart to be poor in spirit. Jesus, you tell me that you're the door into the kingdom, and you tell me that I must to enter into the blessed life of the Beatitudes that you taught on the Sermon on the Mount. You're telling me I must be poor in spirit. Well, it's probably some of it. I I acknowledge that I need a Savior. Let's go there. That's good, yeah. I acknowledge that. But now, this situation where I'm in now, dealing with situations in my life and stuff, I, I want to be more poor in spirit. He says, okay, then, you must then come and learn of me. You get it? So that's what I'm teaching. I always pretty much teach the same thing so that you can learn how to live in God because that's what he's requiring of the bride of Christ. Did you know that? The bride of Christ must be taught how to live in God, not just to claim their tithes and offerings or to you know, Lord, you know, say something to God and you know, he's your errand boy, he's going to go do it. He wants someone in full union with him that has his heart and mind, and in union with him, these things come to pass. Without union in him, it's just another uh, religious exercise. So he says here, he says, look, I I want you to come to me, and I want you to learn about me. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about me. I can't tell you everything right now. But if you come and learn from me, I will cause you to be able to enter into the blessed life that I talk about in Matthew uh, 5, which is you know, earlier on in this book, right? So it's the most wonderful thing that we must learn and come to learn of Jesus. So he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. This is one of the verses that, you know, it's like this has to be your go-to verse a lot more than it is. Why? Because he, it's a direct word from Jesus saying, I want you to come to me and I want you to learn about me. That's what he says. That's a big thing. This, some people say it's one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It may be famous, but I don't know how often it's being obeyed. That's why I'm saying, he says, look, I want everybody who's struggling to come to me. Why? Because you need to learn about me. Oh, really? Yes, I'm going to make you learn about me. Now listen carefully. This goes back to what happened when he took him to Caesarea Philippi, and he says, who, who am I? And they said, well, you know, everybody believes you're a prophet, you know. He says, but who do you guys say that I am? Peter gets it from heaven. He learns something about Jesus from the Father, right? He says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, that's exactly right. You've heard from heaven, You got it? You've heard from heaven. That's going to make you a little stone. That's going to connect you with me, the big stone. That's how I build my church. We'll go there in a few minutes, but you should know those verses. He says there, I I want you to know who I am, and I want you to connect with me. And when you connect with me with heaven's help to reveal who I am, then, of course, you become part of my temple. You become part of my body. You become my ecclesia by who I will rule through on the earth and I will give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever is already prohibited in heaven and you will be in union with us to know I am taking authority over that in your nation or in your home or in your family and you agree with me on earth earth, and forbid it in your life. Repent any places that you've given it, so forth. You repent and then pray for God, the Father and I to release it because we've already released it. You come into agreement with what we're doing in heaven. You know, when the centurion came to Jesus and said, Master, my, my servant is sick. I need you, you know, to pray for him. Jesus said, okay, I'll come. He goes, no, you don't need to come. No, you you don't need to come. I know that you're a man under authority. Jesus said, you got it, buddy. I've never heard anyone explain faith this much. You've got more faith than anybody in all of Israel. That's what he said to him. Well, what was it that this guy saw? 
He says, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. I know you've got authority. And I know you're under the authority of heaven. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy that's got a lot of authority. You know, I can send men to war. I can say this and that, and they have to go. Whatever I say, they got to go. He goes, you have authority. You are under some supernatural authority. Jesus said, that's great faith. Never seen like that in all of Israel. Well, getting back to just this issue of the keys of the kingdom, they work only by revelation. You must hear from heaven. It's not about you binding the powers of darkness. I mean, we're, we're involved in those kind of things at certain levels. We've done it in nations and things. But I would never, ever deal with national issues, uh, demonic powers, that is, or even over some of these big cities here, unless the Lord commissioned me to. But I'm just talking about on normal level of you and I literally hearing from God about our day, about our children, about people on our job or whatever. And he says, you know, I want to forbid that gossiping spirit around the coffee machine. I want to forbid that. I'm, I'm forbidding it. I want you to forbid it on earth. It's spoiling the atmosphere at your work. You get it? So when you hear that, you're, you're, it's like a stone. It's like a rock comes in and you connect more with God because this is how Jesus builds his temple. This is how Jesus builds his church. And it's all by hearing from him. But he tells us, as it says, do we have that now? Great. So you, you know that verse. But let's, I want you to just see Matthew 5, 3 because this is, this is really the core of what I'm trying to teach and I believe it's, this is what pleases the Lord the most. He wants you to have this experience. Now look at what it says. Blessed. Now see, in other words, this is how you get blessed. You know? This is how you receive the blessedness of God. This is how it starts. But it's the first one. This is the door that you must come in. You must be humble, tender of heart, poor in spirit, basically means those who know they need God. You could say it this way. He said it in another way. They said, who's the greatest in the kingdom? He said, those who come as little children. He said, you must be converted and become like little children. That's what he said. So this is pretty much the same genre, right? He says, you must be poor in spirit, for yours is the what? The rule and dominion of heaven. It's yours. Really? Yes. But it's not yours by just naming it and claiming it. You've got to go to me to have that imparted into you. You understand that? You understand that? See, I, I remember the teaching in the 70s, you know, it messed people up. They all thought they had it. All they had was, an, was a, 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 an advertisement. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom. So you must be poor in spirit. And the rule of the kingdom of God is he begins to center you on God's purposes. Heaven begins to give you what you need to live in this fallen world. Jesus said in John um, uh, 14, 10, he goes, the works that I do, it's not me. He goes, it's the Father in me. He's doing it. And that's the way it's supposed to be with us. It's not about us being such holy, awesome people. We want to be that. But it's Jesus in us releasing his holiness in us as we yield to his Holy Spirit. That's how it all works, see? So here it is. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're going to get blessed by having heaven's vision, heaven's thoughts, heaven's impressions, uh, heaven's um, joy, heaven's wisdom, heaven's insight that will rule and reign inside your little heart so that you don't go off and get caught up into this civil war that's coming on the church and in our nation. It's getting a bigger and bigger divide. And you have to end up on the side of the Lord, which is to be humble and tender of heart and pray for your enemies and those who think you're crazy or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It's like, I'm not getting caught up in it. I made my, I stake my case, but I want to be able to say, Lord, I'm going to stand in the gap for your Christians who are blinded. I'm going to stand in the gap for our government, Lord. I want to pray, you know, I want to be like you, you know. You said the house of prayer for all nations, so that's why we're praying next uh, week at uh, noon. Now, I want you to see something else. We'll go here to Matthew 21, and starting at verse uh, 42, uh, Matthew 21, 42. This is really heavy, okay? Because he's talking about taking, if you read this whole parable, he's talking about taking away the kingdom of God and giving it, taking away from the Jews, and they, they end up knowing this. And this is what he says. He goes back to this illustration of a rock again. Remember last week I taught you, if you remember, if you were here, uh, Daniel 2, there's a rock that comes out from heaven and it smashes the kingdoms of this earth. Amen. During the days, it's in historical uh, history of men and women living on this earth. It's simply the Babylonian, you know, Persian, 
these four empires, there's a rock that comes out of heaven and smashes them. Okay, that's going to be before he comes. His enemies will make his footstool. There'll be a rock like David's sling. Boom, Babylon's going to fall. In fact, it's beginning to crack. You'll see it in our nation more and more begin to crack. Babylon's falling, falling, falling. Come out from her, my people, okay? So he's going to talk about now his kingdom that he's going to give to another people. And he uses the illustration of a rock again. He says that he's going to build his church on a rock. He said in Matthew 7 that if you're a doer of my word when the storms come, your house is built upon a rock. Daniel 2, he's going to use the rock to destroy the kingdoms of this world. Peter finds out when he hears from Jesus, Jesus tells him, you're a little rock now because you're now hearing from heaven. You're going to become more and more like me. I'm going to use you to be a living stone. You're going to teach my body about becoming a living stone so I can build my temple, right? All these things, right? So he says now, he's talking about it again here. He's going to talk about himself being a cornerstone. So Jesus says to them, he's talking to the Jews now who are rejecting him. He's going to give his kingdom to another. This is who he says. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone, here we go again, stone, rock. The stone the builders rejected. The stone, the build, Psalm 118, of course. The stone, what the heck? What the heck? Yeah, it's the chief cornerstone that all of them knew, the way that you build buildings. You, uh, you know, there's a chief cornerstone, there's a cornerstone, and everything gets laid according to that. He says, I'm that chief cornerstone. You guys are rejecting me. The stone that you guys have rejected has become the cornerstone. The Father God, the Lord, has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now watch this now. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, that is natural Israel, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Well, that's righteousness and all that. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so what does all this mean? Okay, if you go back to Matthew 5.3, let's put that back up there. When you're struggling, listen carefully now, when you're struggling, and you're struggling about this season or what's going on in our nation or division in the body and all this stuff. Okay, fine. Where are you going to end up? You need to have... Z- 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 Did I ever tell you when I lost my cell phone? Did I ever tell you? Never told you? Well, uh, my uh, nephew, my brother's uh, oldest son, lives with us. And I said, Brian, dude, I lost my cell phone. He goes online. He goes, well, you got... Where's your iPad? He goes, z- 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 Oh, Rick. Uncle Rick. Uh, there's a guy walking down in Pasadena. He's got it. I go, oh, dude, that's amazing. So anyway, I, I go to the, I, I call the police. They said, okay, well, you can meet us here. We've got several other calls. So I go and I find out exactly the, the uh, building that it's in. I go, it's my phone's in that building. <laughs> so, uh, but the police aren't there because she said, well, you have to wait and they'll come. And I said, well, here, have them come here because this is where my phone is. So anyway, as it turns out a few minutes later, a policeman comes around the corner. I flag him down. I go, hey, hey, hey. Uh, I said, I called in. He goes, what's your name? He goes, oh, yeah, you're on my list. He goes, well, what's the problem? I go, my phone's up there. I lost it. It's in that place. So we go up there. They say, no, no, no. The guy's not here. So we go to where he uh, works. They said, no, he's not here anymore. He's over at Connell's, which is a hamburger place uh, over by Mod Auditorium. So we go there. The guy's there. The, the, they talk to him. The policeman says, go sit in your car. We'll have your phone in five minutes. He gave me back my phone. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Why did I tell you? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. Just in case my preaching's no good, it's a good story. So anyway, he goes now. He he says here, he says now, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know what that means? That means you're willing to fall upon Jesus and pour your little heart out until you're just your little heart is all broken and tenderhearted and I cried and, you know, everywhere. You're just exhausted and you pour your heart out. Not always that dramatic, but he's saying, look, I need to have people who are poor in spirit, who recognize they really need me. They're going to bow down. They're going to fall upon me. And they're going to find that I break them in pieces to make them a new creature in Christ. I will cause them to have a cross. It will break and crush the old nature that they may become living stones and part of my holy temple. That's where I'm going with this. So we're sitting there talking about, well, Jesus is going to build his church. Amen, brother. We're living stones. Amen, brother. Well, you need to be broken, bro. You need to be broken. You need to, be, you need to enter into this connection with God, and it ain't fun. It's terrible. There'll be, you know, struggles, and that's why he said, you know, it's like, 
you know, tell some of these guys on television, it's like, tell them, you know, you got to pick up the cross to be, you know, really his disciple. You know, I appreciate all the apostles and prophets and stuff, but I'm just trying to be a disciple, to pick up my cross every day. It's like, dang, it's more difficult than being a prophet or anything else. Just being a disciple of Jesus, you know, is hard enough. Why? Because he wants me to lose my life. So I have to enter into the blessed life by saying, I really need you. And, and you know what it is? You know what will prompt me to really need the Lord? There are designed ordeals in life that will lead you right to that verse. And it'll either make you bitter or better. Why did this happen to me? You know? Why did this, why, why, why did this happen to me? I don't know. But I know that it's not supposed to make you bitter. It's supposed to make you better. But it'll never happen. You won't enter into the blessed life until we have this sense of, Lord, I, I, I have to humble myself or he'll resist me. What? Yes, he resists the poor. He, he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I need grace. You know, to what? Love my wife. Love God. Be faithful, you know. Endure temptation, you know. Uh, uh, you know, endure what we're going through. E everything. I need grace. Oh, God, I need grace. I want grace. Well, have you humbled yourself lately? Gee, I never thought about that, Lord. You know? Give me mercy. Who have you been merciful to in the last month? I, I'm not, I, I don't know, Lord. I'm not too sure. Sorry. Well, if you want to enter into the blessed life, the door is you must become like a little child, poor in spirit, that you know that you need God. Then the rule, the dominion, it's the king's dominion. That's the word. Kingdom is made up of king and dominion. The king's dominion from heaven will begin to influence your life. And believe me, my friend, that's exactly what you need to live this life in this fallen world. And then when you get filled up, you can give it away to others. This morning, I mean, it was beautiful. God bless all of you who prophesied and those of you who were just here to create a beautiful environment. It wasn't like some great power of God or the glory of God came down, but we just sat there and all of a sudden, boom, 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 like little popcorn all over the place, see? That's what it, that's what it was, right? Popcorn's good, you know? And uh, it had a lot of butter on it. It was really good. I really appreciate it. But all of you, oh, you better listen to this one. This is, when I teach prophetic classes, this is what I always say. You've got to move within the sphere of the fruit of the Spirit because we will not hear the voice of a stranger. What do you mean by that? You can tell when someone has an agenda. You can, you can feel it. You can taste it. All of those words were soft, tender, and they ministered encouragement, comfort, and strength to us, didn't they? Yes, they did. So it was all in the sphere of the fruit of the Spirit. Then people, you know, uh, sometimes will step out of that sphere and begin into their own opinions and begin to preach you their favorite doctrine that applies to you right now, see? And I tell people, you can't do that. That's, you're being a dictator. It's of your own solical energy. It doesn't work here, you know. But I don't have to do that with you 25 or 30 this morning. And I'm always pretty nice when I do it. But it's like you have to know that if you're not moving in the fruit of the Spirit, then it's really not God, even if it's biblical what you say, because it's not the voice of the Lord. We only want to hear the beautiful voice of Jesus. And now there's other dimensions of prophetic words that are more intense. The voice of a prophet is uh, sometimes, you know, can make you fear and quake. And, and I say amen to all of that as well. So I'm just hitting this very strong. This is the door into the blessed life. This is the door. And you, we must all come to this door and begin to recognize, oh, how I need Jesus. What is he going to do? He's going to break me down, you know. Life is designated. It's like, well, how do I pick up my cross? Just live the life he gave you. That's how you do it. That's, uh, you know, because it's built in. It's, it's built in. Just live, live life. You have, well, I just do this, this, this. But there'll be a cross. There'll, your cross will be, you'll find your cross in your life. You will find it. Don't worry. You can't lose it, okay? You won't lose it. If you're a Christian, it's like before you, behind you, and around you. It doesn't matter. And, but you need to know it because a lot of people, their counsel doesn't include the cross, and that's a, a real shame. So I pray that you understand what I said today. Jesus is going to build his church. Who's he going to build his church with? He's going to build it with little stones who hear from heaven. 
He's going to build it with gentle, tender-hearted people who become rocks in God. Unmovable, overcomers, fearless, invincible. Who will begin to have faith that will say, that thing that's tormented my bloodline for many generations, I know now that I'm receiving the gift of faith and I'm commanding it to be broken in the name of my Savior. Oh, these things come by the unction of the Holy Spirit, not by just a doctrine, but by an experience. God wants to give his church true authority. That's the keys of the kingdom. That's only part of it, let alone the word of God and other things as well. But when God begins to tell you what I want to prohibit in your life, what I want you now to release, because we're releasing it to you. Sometimes people come out of a season of really being not teachable in an area, in their heart, and they finally get to kind of a rock and a hard place, and they begin to look up and begin to look at God and so forth, that's when he really begins to be able to say, I want to forbid this kind of an attitude. This is what's defiling you. Okay. Yes, Lord, I want to be poor in spirit. I want to bow before you so that I can get the blessing of heaven's rule in my life. Let's stand up and pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Who's on the ministry team today? Okay, great. We've got a lot of them. Praise God, Rob and Glory are here, and the Andersons, I think, and, you know, Peggy's here, and, okay. So, anyway, well, Lord, um, you want to build your church of living stones. We're supposed to hear from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray today in your holy name that you would bless your kids. Lord, any of us that, you know, need to be adjusted, praise God, hallelujah, but Lord, uh, uh, you know, I just feel today we'll do it a little differently. Let's just break up in groups, those around you here, in groups of three or four. Oh, let's do four or five. And we're, I'm going to pray general prayers, and we're going to pray over you guys. I think that's what we'll do. We'll give a break to the ministry. We'll do the ministry team in a little bit. Okay, are you ready? Go ahead and get in little groups here. And we're going to pray. And what I'd like you to do is pray over each one separately. And you pray for this message to invade their heart.